Esoteric Lighthouse. We have with us this evening a guest speaker or the panel, I should say, um, good brother, comes from St. Mary's Lodge um, out of the jurisdiction of Detroit, uh, Michigan. He's a worshipful master, um, good brother. Um, tonight he'll be speaking about Masonic geometry. And uh, before we let him take over and give us his um, lecture, we just wanted to give uh, reverence and recognition to all the new um, Grand Inspector Generals of the Dr. Jerry Vaughn class of 2021. Um, it was myself, Coney S. Vaughn Sr. Um, we also had this year from another class, um, the, the, the wonderful Dr. Charles Watson himself, Grand Inspector General. <laughs> he was inducted this year as well. Uh, we had Errol Simpson, Grand Inspector General Errol Simpson as well. He's not on the call tonight. And uh, we had uh, Grand Inspector General Vernon Thunderbolt. Um, as well. So it was a blessing to see everyone there. And uh, we know that we all will do well and uh, make a mark in masonry. So now I hand it over to Worshipful Master Stephen Barrett. You have the floor, sir. Hey, illustrious sir, I appreciate it. Again, like I said, my name is Stephen Barrett. Uh, I help from St. Mary's Lodge number four uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, here under the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of uh, Michigan. Um, but tonight I'm here just as a regular brother just to have a conversation about Masonic geometry. So just want to double check. Can everybody see my screen? We're good to go. Yes, sir. I can see it. All right. All right. So real quick going down the road, getting the ball rolling. Um, first, just to let you know, Esoteric Lighthouse. Um, we're a group, group of free and accepted Masons from regular and recognized Masonic Grand Lodges. Focus on the esoteric, occult, and philosophical lessons found in Freemasonry. Um, this being a public forum, our views and interpretations are not legal or official statements or opinions of any Grand Lodge or Masonic bodies in which we hold membership in. All opinion, thoughts, and interpretations are solely of the individual panelists. Don't get mad at my Grand Lodge, get mad at me. Yeah, so we're going to have some fun here this evening. Now, jumping into Masonic geometry, so the understanding this is the fifth liberal art. So... I saw this quote by Plato, and it, it really intrigued me as I was going through this research, is it is through geometry that one purifies the eye of the soul. But later on going back, I want you to be able to contemplate on that, because like I said, as Masons, we understand or we talk about geometry and its reverence, but we need to understand a little bit why. You know, that's how this came about. I had a question of, and I asked a bunch of people, like, why, why is geometry so passionate? And then um, I got pointed into an area that might sound a little bit familiar to individuals, okay? And so we talked about it sometimes when we're going in that middle chamber. We talk about a point to a line, to superficies, to a solid. And so I was digging a little bit deeper and understanding, like, what is this process? Why is this occurring? And then so I had to start to break it down. So we're going to talk about it from a first, from a practical standpoint, then we'll dive into a little bit more esoterically. So a point is a dimensionless figure or individual part of space. Now realize this, understanding this, that even if you take a pen and mark a piece of paper, that's still not a point because that ink on the paper is raised. So you have to think about it as that finite. So understand, too, then what we do is when we have two of these dimensionless figures, together we end up getting a line. So that's connected with one, and that's basically a figure of one capacity, which is length. Then we go to superficies, which is basically when you have three points, and it gives you basically a two-dimensional figure naming length and breadth. And then lastly, we talk about is going to a solid, which is the first three-dimensional object that we have, and it's length, breadth, and thickness. Now, there's a process that goes on when you go through each of these that basically enlightens us on our journey that we're going to dive a little bit in there. And what it basically is is progression. You have to understand that this is a foundation. So in a part, this might sound familiar to individuals, but like it says, this is a science is used by the grand architect to draw his plans on the eternal trust aboard, construct worlds, time seasons, and everything we experience. So as the sun is in the, so we, you know, we think about this, it's all connected. So like, this is where we're going to find in, and we're going to go through a little deeper understanding of this standpoint. Now, first starting off with a point. A point is the beginning of all forms and finite things. In that sense, it's the most abstract representation of affinity of a finite form. 
it does not even have definition specific boundaries, size or dimensions, and therefore is the most abstract finite thing that can emerge from a formless infinity. Infinity, excuse me. Most of the time, they're present before an audience. The point is a source of whole of holes, imbued as a seed of unfolding a sacred mystery. So I have here thinking about it. Once we dive in a little bit deeper, it's basically like I said, a seed. It's, it's a plant that's going to grow out. That's going to help us out with uh, formation and creation. Now, with this, you have to realize more than, than a point. Now, this is the beginning, and we're talking about a monad. So you go back and research a little bit more about that. But the monad, or the oneness, expressed as a point within the circle is the foundation of our geometric construction of the universe. Understand that a circle is just not a curve. The space inside the circle expresses the most practical and efficient geometry of space for nature, natural, and human creation to occur. Now, this is the part that mesmerized me, is learning that a circle encloses the most space with the smallest perimeter. We've got to think about efficiency when we're talking about creation. And this symbol should be familiar to a lot of Masons. And what I want people to think of, the reason why the circle is moving is because you have to understand something when we go down there. I want you to think of yourself as that point. And if you were to put your hands out, stretch them out as far as you possibly can, and then rotate 360 degrees, this is kind of what I want you to think about with the, port, uh, the point and dimension and understanding space as we go forward. Now, what we'll do is, this is how we're going to get to the line. So as we talked about on the previous slide, the point within the circle, when we have two of these, when they move, when we have two of these together, you look at these two edges, these points, it actually forms a line. And a line is a picture of energy, tension, force, and action, impulse, urge, direction, and movement. A line creates both the boundary that divides as well as a link that binds. This is the first time we get the illusion of separation and duality. This is a manifestation. manifestation is another symbol of the checkered floorboard. So thinking about this again, as Masons, we see that checkered floorboard, that line not only does it divide the good and the evil, but it also combines it all together in one because you can't just avoid one checker square versus another. You have to go through it all, so it's together. Now, one thing to note, too, is just within these two circles, we start to get more points, and we actually go into a superficies, which is a triad. And basically like a trinity. So once we have this third point, we get length and breadth like we talked about. This is first actualized by the equilateral triangle. And it is the first area enclosed and opposite of the circle. So it's the smallest area with this greatest perimeter. And the equilateral triangle is strength and stability, but it's still also a two-dimensional object. So what this is letting you know from like a geometrical standpoint is that there's a lot of support and stability that comes in. Once you add that third leg, that becomes a very stable table. And this is something and a concept that we must remember as we go forward. Now, here we come down, we get the fourth point, and we get a, a solid, and this is where actually our world is manifested. So the fourth point gives us depth or volume, and at this point, we have this volume and this creation of the physical, tangible object. So this is a square, which we talk about a lot in masonry, and it connecting four center points of four circles, and it gives us also the four cardinal directions, the things that we use to be able to navigate. So again, I'm using this picture so you can see that at this point, we're getting a little bit more into, again, we like, why do we care about geometry? Why is masonry revered geometry so much? We have to dive into it and understand that, again, like I said, it's all about creation. And so once we combine the science and the esoteric knowledge, we're going to get a bigger picture of this. So my goal right now is actually let's try and create a world. Let's go through that process to get a better understanding. So first starting out here, let's read a familiar scripture that we talked about that starts with the point within the circle. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, and the earth was out form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So I want to be very crystal clear that we look at it. So we started with that point in the circle from the first monad. We have to tie that in. So remember, we were the that middle point. We had our hands out. We were doing a circle. We figured out what's going on. We figured out our surroundings. So once we go to the edge of our hand, we're going to move again, and we're going to duplicate that process again. Okay, so that's why we have the finger showing movement, because it's not two separate circles. It's one consciousness at one point, and then it moves to the next. 
Now, this is the part that is inspiring for me. It says, and the next line says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, for most people, that's something that just kind of comes through. And you're like, yes, God created light. Let's go. Here, once you dive in as a Mason, this is reverence with your soul and your spirit, because this point, if you look at those two circles that are together up at the top, and you look at that middle part, that middle part is actually called a vesica Pisces. And when you look at it, that is actually the mathematical equation of light. So what I'm pointing out, so you can see what the illustrations is, first, the Spirit of God had to move, and then there became light. And this is ironic that this is the exact same thing that happens when we study sacred geometry. So is there a coincidence when you have the two correlate with one another? I think not. And I think our ancient brethren understood this concept. Now, again, there's some points for us to remember that make sure that we're on point. Again, you have to have two points to have movement. And then you have to understand from the Vesica Pisces, that middle part is basically the building blocks of life. It gives you not just the mathematical equation for light, but it gives you also the Fibonacci sequence. And it also gives you some of the dynamiters and as well as the mathematical equations to do three-dimensional objects, which we'll get into more. And the biggest thing, and I think this is the secret that we're going to give out, um, that's not really a secret, is that there's no separation or division of consciousness. It's literally just expansion and replication. That's the only thing that's happening in this. And once you pull back that veil and you start to understand this, I think it gives people, as well as most Masons, the understanding of like the beauty of the world. It goes back again to that checker pavement. That line, that line can either be a division or it can be a thing that brings us together. Now going into the third point that we talked about, creating a, a trinity in this sense, this third circle, it actually, again, you've seen this pretty familiar. We talk about three. Three is very, very synonymous. Three degrees of masonry. There's three light, great light. There's all these things. You have the Father, Son, uh, the Holy Spirit, Father, Mother, Son, three wise men, three musketeers, three wishes, three stages of man, three primary colors. There's so much in the world that represents these three basic functions of items. And what has to understand is, is when you look at three, it's basically talking about throughness, like going through something. It's just transformation. So you understand that it's a process of rebirth, transformation, then getting success. So understand like, hey, father, mother come together, transformation, there's creations, there's the child. And you can see this in so many other, other aspects not only biological, physical, emotional, you have your three brains, they work in tandem. There's so many different other things that go through that this three denotes. Now, one thing I thought that was very interesting is in the, uh, to the Hindus, the principle of light, energy, and mass are the three gunas or qualities which come out to purity, activity, and inertia. And what this does is it actually blends in the different um, proportion and all the process and events that happen outside and around us. So everything that we're experiencing in life is basically being factored into this, and we're getting the part of creation. So we're getting into a more spiritual realm, and then what ends up popping up after that is we go through some of these items that's going to go step into creation again. Now, again, a couple points to remember. The equilateral trial and a lot, almost, I don't want to say every, but vast majority of religion, spirituality, uh, equal out of triangles always represent divinity, the divine. Um, so is it like ironic that it is that? Why not four? Why not five? Why not two? Why not one? We understand that through this creation and you going through this process and transformation, that's where it lies. And that's why it represents deity, because deity is going through this transformation to help an individual that. Understanding the study of the triangle, you're going to understand balance. Again, we talked about the equilateral triangle being the area with the, it's the smallest area of the biggest perimeter. Um, it's just something that we have to be able to touch in. And then with, even with alchemy, we understand that it's not until we get that third element that's introduced that change actually happens. So understand that the three spheres whose centers are connected, remember the point within a circle, three spheres, we're getting now into, like I said, the deeper meaning and understanding, and this is reflected in, like I said, not just only spirituality, religion, but also science. Now, getting into, now we have our fourth point, because remember, we talked about going on the first slide, we talked about from a point to a line to superficies to a solid. So now we're in the fourth movement. So remember, we talked about move, God move, 
Now, the fourth mood, it creates the fourth circle. At this point, we actually get physical manifestation. And this is Malkuth, or Earth. So esoterically, this is the meaning of stability. Think about everything that we talked about is like a square, like an Earth is stable, it's tangible. So even the ancient Egyptians and the Mayans, they actually had different um, things drawn that show like four pillars coming from Earth to support the heavens. Because it's saying that this fourness, like I said, in this creation, the heaven is vast. It's not, it's not this tangible thing in this situation and what we're thinking. But again, we're creating like the world, Earth. That's what geometry is about. Now, because we talked about this creation of Earth, we need to look at something else a little bit more additional because now that we got into creating three-dimensional forms, one of the first geometrical frames that you'll get is the tetrahedron. And what I thought was ironic was this thing that looks like a triangle that we'll look at here in a little bit is actually the basis of amino acids, which is actually the building blocks of life. So is it really that much of a coincidence that we're studying some of these things and not only do we see it in math, we see it in science, we see it in spirituality, and esotericism, it's all telling the same story. So in my mind, one plus one equals two, it really is just adding up from that point. And understanding that nature's patterns are based on the mathematics of three-dimensional space. So in essence, nature's creative process basically comes out and yields out the fruit by giving birth to volume. So once you have volume, that's what I'm saying, nature which is created by the grand architect of the universe, is going to that portion of getting everything that we see around us. And I have here on the side basically a tree of awareness because as we see, we start off in the physical experience uh, of reality, which is Malkuth. We have it, we're starting from that sephiroth, and that's like kind of like the starting stages from this direction if you're going working your way from bottom up. Now, what I have here, just for like a little bit of homework for other individuals, we talked about the tetrahedron earlier, which is in the top left-hand corner, it's ironic. Remember, we talked about the representation of a deity is normally these three points as an equilateral triangle. It looks kind of like an equilateral triangle when you look at it, like if you're actually coding it. And I kind of find that inter interesting, too, because it's a representation of fire. Baptized by it. But we'll talk about those things. We can go in there. We can dive in there. We can look. Now, I did only put four platonic sonics on here because there is a fifth shape. Now, that fifth shape in some circles, in some areas, um, was something so magical and powerful that just the mere mention of you might lose your life. Because there's so much consciousness and different type of information that's held within that fifth circle. So I would challenge the individuals who are watching this to later on look up that one and actually go through it and look and actually do some research. But here are the four basic ones that all come out of just literally that Vesica Pisces. Every one of these shapes, once we have the four points, we go through it, we can actually form all these four shapes, which are all the building blocks of everything that has to deal with life. Now, diving into this a little bit deeper, I saw this quote, and this thing reaches out to me and speaks to my soul, because literally we were asked the question, what do we most crave? And we gave an answer here. And so when giving that answer, do we realize and understand that we're going to go down this track record or go down this, this, this journey? And I don't think many of us do. We were told to study these several liberal arts and sciences and ask these questions about what's going on in the creation of the world. Hopefully now you can see a, a small, small, very high level, surface level understanding of geometry. And that geometry is really just us trying our best to be able to experience what the grand architect of the universe has put in store for us. Just as we admire and admonish and we look at some of these painters, the grand architect of the universe is using this whole entire universe as a canvas. And at this point, when you study geometry, I fully believe this, the most simplest thing to you at this point will be something of amazement. I did not truly, truly like know, know what was going on and know about the Grand Architect Universe until I actually studied geometry. There was things that I read everywhere else, and I was like, yeah, I know, I feel it's here, I feel this, I have faith. But now at this point, like, I know, and it's because of geometry, because I don't believe that anything in here, if you look at the way things are set up, is too complex, and it's too, it's too deep 
to just be mere coincidence. I just, I just can't, I can't buy that because when you look at how everything is connected and you look at the manifestation and you go through how literally certain individual situations that occur, occur all across the world in the same fashion, same manner, whether you look down to a molecule, uh, a molecule or you look at something as the universe. And to me, that just sounds like design. And that's why I believe as Masons, we study geometry so that we can be it, better have a chance to understand or at least have admiration for the grand architect of the universe and the beauties that we have. Once you study these things and study sacred geometry, I feel like you will walk outside, just look up and just smile and feel blessing. So without further ado, that is my presentation on Masonic geometry. Here are some of my references that I use to be able to put together this presentation. So if you go through and you look at it, um, Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe. I just recently got this. I would say if you're a new Master Mason, I feel like this is uh, one of those top 10 books that you have to have in your, in your library. Um, it just, it's, it's, just it's, that, it's that powerful. So I put that out there. We have the Quadridium. You can find this on Amazon. It's like a geometry. And like I said, just take your time, go through, and have fun. So I'll go ahead and, and stop sharing my screen, but I appreciate it, gentlemen. Awesome job. Awesome job, Stephen. My God, mind blowing. Man, mind blowing. (laughs) (laughs) Outstanding. Outstanding. Especially like the the graphics on your PowerPoint. I like that, man. That was good. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. This I like I said, this is I I I didn't have the question. I didn't know, man. I, I asked so many people, like, why do we study geometry? No one could tell me, man. So I had to this is this is my this is my 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 portion, my step one. I'm gonna do another one, and I'm gonna work on another one. But yeah, it's it's something, man. Yeah, the beginner's you. guide is a beast. I'm reading that right now with you, and yeah. man, <laughs> I'm sitting up here. The 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 science, the the math that you know what what the building blocks, like you said, that we're made of those platonic solids, all of those things. When you look at Genesis and you look at the Kabbalah, and you take all of that and how you tied it together, you see the creator. You see the universe in action. You see your portion inside the universe. If you are true and sincere into your searches, you see these connections and you figure out your role and you try your best to fit in. Yeah, and the the, the beauty of all that is you know, from time to time, we we say you read the Quran, you may read the Quran in Arabic, right? Th- certain things are revealed to you. Let's say you read the Bible and you you read the Old Testament in, in Hebrew. These are languages that we use to uh, interpret these volume of sacred laws. Well, the, the very first volume of sacred law, Brother Barrett went into, is nature itself, creation. And so we needed a language, you know, what language do we use to read what I call the real book of revelations? And that's nature itself. In geometry, as we study in the uh, middle chamber, you have geometry, which is the study of numbers in space. And then you have music, which is the study of numbers in time or frequency. And then you have astronomy, which is the study of numbers in space and time. But we wouldn't even be able to understand the things that we see every day. Every pattern in nature that you can see with your eyes is a geometrical pattern. And if we didn't ever learn to read that language, we probably wouldn't have the technology that we have today. Because most of the technology that we have today, man has gotten these technologies by studying the great book of revelations, nature itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough. I, I love your concept um, and how you broke down the point within the circle. Um, with that, it made me think of the schism schism uh, that Brother Charles Watson did a presentation on uh, long, not too long ago. And the motions, the vibration, and I like the background that you use with it, um, look like a water drop into the ocean. And that represents that same thing as the schism, schism, and the motion, that centrifugal force. It makes me think of the uh, the dervishes, the dancing dervishes, when they move around, 
and they're doing their fire dances. So it's a lot going on when you look at the point within the circle. It's not, it's not a stagnant image where it's just stand still and it looks like that. Uh, as we also know, it represents the sun, the alchemical symbol for the sun. And the sun is a gaseous figure, a helium, uh, mostly helium, and it's moving. It's not stagnant. So when we look at the point within the circle, we have to put that, that figure or ob object into motion. I found it interesting. Oh, go ahead, brother. Oh, no, I yield to you, brother. I was saying the one thing, like, while going through some of this, and we was talking about the point with circles, first, understanding, like, when I was reading, like, the Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe, it was, you have to understand and realize that, even like you said, if you put a point and draw a point on a piece of paper, that's still not truly a point. But like he said before, like you, um, Lester's Watson did in his presentation, that's the first thing that we can do that gives us a finite type of, it, it constructs down. So the grand architecture of the universe is all here. So like, I'm going I'm to construct this down into this and I'm going to start right here. And at this point, if you can understand the connection between two, because you can't have movement without two points. Like you can't have direction without two points. So you have these two dimensionless things that are interacting with one another, but in actuality, it's just one. So that's what blew me away, because that was the first time that I realized that this is the first like falsehood of you thinking of separation and duality. Like that blew me away, because I'm thinking like, I was thinking there's two points, and technically it is, but not really. It's just the one point moved over. And once you look at that, and just like I said, the map that connects it together, it's just a beautiful thing. Like, I'm still trying to study it because I've been done, like, calculus and other stuff in a long time. So, like, I got to, like, dive into it. But just realizing these two dimensionless points create so much just by their movements between each other. And, again, I think that comes back to stuff you learn in other houses when it comes to motion, equilibrium, and some other things that go on. You understand that this is, this is just you, bro. This is you. you that point within that circle. But as you move throughout, I don't know, camps or something of that nature, you do something, you're creating this energy, you're creating light, you're going through a creative process and a transformation process. That's the whole part of it. It's transforming. Like, nothing is stagnant. And I don't know. Like I said, this was... It took me about a month to put this together because I just kept stopping and going off on sidetracks. So I was like, man, this is just, it's just something that I think we have to consistently study. And you can study at whatever you love or you're comfortable with. Like, you don't have to go into trigonometry. You can stay at just like, you know what I mean? Like, I just encourage people who watch this to just Google something and just watch it, man, and just enjoy the ride, you know? Yeah, and geometry was very important to the uh, operative masons, the stone masons. Um, if you go back and you look over the uh, the Regis poem or the Cook manuscript, these it, it all has references um, to geometry. Geometry was very important. If you go back in that day and time, though, uh, we'll, we'll stay in the European era for now. Um, you know, a lot of times they didn't have um, you know they didn't have running water. You know, they they were illiterate. A lot of them couldn't read or write, and so a lot of what they learned from building these Gothic cathedrals they passed this information down from mouth to ear. You know what I mean? They did it through initiatory type systems and things like that. And a lot of this was dealing with geometry, um, right angles, horizontals, and uh, perpendiculars. They couldn't build these great cathedrals without it. If we go a little bit further back uh, to the Egyptians, the pyramids, you, we, we know that the um, so-called Pythagorean theorem or the 47 probably Euclid had to exist um, in, in Egypt in order to erect um, these pyramids. And so it's just, it's just a beautiful thing to um, see geometry so incorporated in speculative masonry. So, because what we did is we took this, what, what we would call a operative art and we turned it into a speculative science. And so we use to frame up, you know, all of this building these cathedrals, we're not building these big cathedrals using geometry anymore. We're, we're building character now. We're building these types of temples, but the concept's still the same. That's the beauty. And that's why you can't, you know, I, I mentioned the Regis poem in the Cook manuscript. You can go also to Anderson's constitution. They all reference geometry. 
but they reference geometry being synonymous with masonry. And it, and it really is because that's what we're doing. We're not here. Uh, I was reading something the other day about geometry and it says, if you go back to, uh, to the operative days and you ask stonemasons, take two stonemasons and ask them a question, they may answer it two different ways. And that question is, what are you doing? And one, and one um, stonemason may say, well, I'm laying stones. That's one way to look at it, right? And then another stonemason will say, I'm building a great work or a great fifth cathedral. And I think you still see that today in, in masonry. Um, I, I was listening to a brother online was venting about how masonry has turned into like a business instead of the speculative science that it was, it was set out to be. And I was trying to wrestle with that in my mind. And I said, you know, we can have both if we just understand uh, that we need a focus. We need to talk about building rent and, and dues and membership and things like that. But I call that laying stones. It should not be the primary focus. The, the primary focus should be the erect directing of a great cathedral, which is your character, character building. And all of this is synonymous with geometry. All of it. Couldn't build without it. So yeah, uh, when, when you mentioned the, uh, the 47 problem of Euclid in Egypt, uh, it made me think about a lecture that I got from a very close friend of mine and a mentor of mine in the Scottish Rite. Um, I don't want to say his name on there, but uh, he did a lecture on uh, the slipknot rope or three by four slipknot rope, how the Egyptians used to lay out their plots uh, to harvest their wheat, their wheat. And, you know, they pull a slipknot and then they do their thing. Then that was the same technique that they used to lay the pyramid using the 47 problem of Euclid. And, um, and when when you mentioned that, Brother Watson, that um, it, it hit home because, you know, I was like, hey, my, my, my mentor, he gave me that lecture before. And, you know, it was actually at our Council of Deliberation. He did it at our Council of Deliberation in Japan. And uh, it was amazing. And then uh, back to Brother Barrett on the, the point within the circle and the vibratory movement, then it forms the Vesca Pisces. When you look at the compass and square, what are, what's right in the center? It's a Vesca Pisces right in front of you. You wearing it on your ring finger or not on your ring finger, but on whichever finger you put your Masonic ring on or you have that um, pendant on your chest. And when you look at the nature of the compasses, what is the compass's purpose? To draw that point, you lay a point and you draw the circle around. What is a square? An angle of 90 degrees or a fourth part of a circle. So it's right there, it's telling you, you got two circles right there and you're walking around with it. And then the, the culminating event is the Vesca Pisces with the G coming through, giving birth to light with inside you. I know you mentioned the point within the circle a little bit earlier, and I think Brother Barrett's uh, his first slide uh, where he was showing the contrast between the different uh, schools of thought uh, was an, it looked like an alchemical chart. And in alchemy, if you go and look, the, the, the process of alchemy is taking something of lesser value and transmuting into something higher, higher value, which we see in masonry. You know, we have, a, a, we come in as rough ashlers and the goal is to build this cathedral or this temple or our characters and turn it into, uh, from the vices and superfluities over to a more virtuous type of, of, of platform. But in that system, it's, it's known as an alchemy is turning lead to gold. And if you go back and look at the alchemical symbol, symbol in alchemy of gold, it is the point within the circle. I laugh because you say that. Because oh, go go ahead. No, I was just saying it. You you guys know how I always get on my bandwagon about because we study all these different schools of thought. And I I, I tell you, once you pull back the cover or the veil from these different schools of thought, um, man, you see the same moral truths. And, and a lot of times you see some of the same symbols moving through um, these different schools of thought. 
um, just some conversations we've all had on here. Well, some of us have had on here is some of us received the 33rd degree uh, this year. And we were talking about some of those things that went on the 33rd degree. It was just amazing how many different schools of thought you could see in that degree, as well as the several other degrees in masonry. You can tell that the men who constructed these degrees were influenced by these different schools of thought, just like the men that are on here now, as I hear Brother Barrett showed us all the books that he's reading and Brother Wim said, hey, I'm stuck in this book too. And uh, Brother Coney just shared something in our private group me group of a book I got to go spend a hundred and something dollars to get, right? <laughs> because these brothers said, well, you know, I usually don't spend that much money on the book, but the brothers on this panel was telling me that this book is worth it. So I got to go tonight and, and, and go ahead and get that book. But my point being is that the men who constructed these degrees were learned men and these men had access to books and they read these books and it's hard for me to 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 believe that some of what they were reading did not seep into our degree systems it's it's really blatantly obvious right oh <clears throat> absolutely and, the, and you brought up something that's I, I think that's very powerful and again it comes down to sacred geometry like I, this is I'm a novice at it, but this is like, I think this is going to be like my 10, 15 years from now, this is like my wheelhouse because it's literally throughout all these civilizations in different places and different times, they have the flower of life. And what's ironic, why is it called the flower of life in every single place you go though? And it's just weird because I think there's certain divine truths. And I think that's what's, what's math. We're on a base 10 system here. You know what I mean? That's what we do with base 10. If we were base three, it'd be something different. But we're in a base 10 system. But no matter what language you speak, one plus one still equals two. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's like this universal law. And I think once you, like you said, Brother Watson, once you see things that are passing through that are the same, so if they're one plus one in every language equals two, I think there's divine truth in that. Like that's that to me that's what it is. It's like it's a divine truth. And I think when I study sacred geometry, like the flower of life, the seed of life, the egg of life, look at how a baby is born. It literally goes into it's like it's one cell, then it splits up into two, then it creates the form of the same thing of the seed of life, the flower of life. So that happens at creation. You look at a seed that comes out of the ground that plants out, it's the same type of formation, the same geometrical shapes. Is there's just a foundation of this that is true. And I believe it's hard pressed that if you're a mason, not to have some kind of knowledge of this. Now, I don't think you need to be an expert. But you need to have some kind of knowledge of this because I believe that would enhance your Masonic experience. And I think you'll walk differently. I know that's not crazy, but I do think you walk differently when you understand some of this stuff. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. We see geometry. I think all of us on here at this point um, are married and have brides. And, and literally the first time you saw your bride, you saw a beautiful geometrical pattern that existed within nature <laughs> literally you know now you might have said she was all of that or she was the bomb or she was whatever the words you may have used but at the end of the day she was beauty in proportion <laughs> is what she was she was a geometrical pattern you know? yeah i'm gonna yeah. use that i'm gonna wake the, i'm gonna wake the missus up i'm gonna say oh you <laughs> geometrical pattern in time and space and, oh boy you <laughs> <laughs> and now the next time we see Brother Barrett, if he have a black eye, we already know what happened. That went all wrong. She, she might look at you like a geometrical pattern. What's wrong? With you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did want to um, read something that I that I found in the Phylaxis, um in regards to Pythagoras and the Forty Seven Problem. It is said that. The Masonic doctrine that a man named Pythagoras invented what is called the 47th problem of Euclid, and that he sacrificed a hecatomb upon the discovery of it. And during his travels throughout Asia, Africa, and Europe, was raised to the sublime degree of a master mason. Only in masonry will you find these statements. The 47th problem of Euclid was being used for at least a thousand years in Babylon, which is Iraq now. Syria and Egypt before Pythagoras was even born. He was not raised to the sublime degree of master mason during his travels because that speculative degree in masonry was not developed back then. 
Oh, no, come on, come on, stop. Pythagoras didn't sacrifice a hecatomb of 100, which is equal to 100 head of cattle, because according to legend, he was a vegetarian and did not have that kind of money to own them, nor even travel with them. Yes, yes. So, however, like most Greek scientists and philosophers, he did a study and was taught in Egypt. Yeah. So just to give a little historical reference and correction <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for our listeners. <laughs> and, and the thing is, it's not to, uh, we know how distorted history can be. And our goal is never to minimize anyone's contribution through history. But our goal isn't also, it isn't to uh, disregard parts of history that we know and we understand. And so, hey, the Greeks did their thing when they got a hold of this information and they enhanced it. And that's a beautiful thing. I often wonder this, brothers, like, where did the Egyptians get it from? You know, like at mm-hmm. some point, and then we say, um, like if Brother House was on here, he he has his his thing. And I know Brother um, Greenway was on here. He, and, and so he has his thing. We can go back and say, well, this culture did it. This culture did it. But at some point, we're going to have to ask the question, where did that culture get it from? Yeah. And yeah. Well, you know see- what I mean? One of the problems is we we, will never know because what happened, uh, you know, history or his story uh, when the uh, Alexandria, which was, you know, the library of thieves, you know, Timbuktu, these libraries were burned, ravaged, destroyed, and the information that was in there, you know, what they couldn't understand, they destroyed. And that's, that's in that essence, we we lost a lot of yeah. pertinent information that could could probably been we could be living better than we are now as humans as a species if those books hadn't have been destroyed, right? Those manuscripts, those scrolls, those things. Uh, yeah. But you know, uh, people fear what they don't know and don't understand, and they don't want anybody else to know or understand something that they can't understand. Even if you look at Nikola Tesla, the real guy, and his science locked up in archives, things like that, because they don't want that information to get out, because he who has the real power has control over everything. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. good to see see the um, Philaxis Society had that published in as, as an article. I, I read that in there as well. I did a lecture, one of my lectures uh, last year, it had something in there about a heck of cone. And I, in doing my research, I found out as well that he was a vegetarian and he was very against um, sacrificing animals. You know, so it seems like something that he probably wouldn't have done. I can, you know, we can't really say for certainty, but the probability says he probably wouldn't have done that. Right. We, and we know a lot, a huge part of what we hear in, in, inside of, uh, I call it Masonic legend. It's just that it's a legend. There's no historical, um, a matter of fact, if you go back and you read the Regis poem, he literally says that in that poem. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so, again, that's the difficult part for a lot of brothers when they're when they're reading this material, trying to decipher what's historically accurate and can be supported with primary and secondary sources, and what is just part of the legend. You know what I mean? And I love. I'm gonna tell you, I love that part of of uh, of masonry, the legendary parts, because I don't get them confused, mm-hmm. but they do help inspired the process of um, temple building, which is which the foundation of temple building, again, is, is geometry. You can't build anything without the understanding of the geometry. Right. It, it's funny you say that, too. So I did some research from a psychology class. Mm-hmm. Legitimately, they say the best way to teach a child is through parables. It's yeah. the story. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's, so if that is the most efficient way why would you feel that as an adult that wouldn't be efficient and effective as well? So whether it was the Noah Kite story or it's high, Grandmaster Hiram Bibb, it don't it don't matter. You just need that, and once you understand, if you once you understand it's an allegory, we'll go through this and we can understand. Like then we can have a deeper conversation about who really are the ruffians or what are they. Or then you go to other places and you you combat these five things. You know what I mean? That's 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 going against humanity. Like there's all this that you understand that there's a story behind it, and you can you can take it take it farther. I was reading that book with my my kids and we were reading about uh, Aesop and his stories, and it's just like we can, he can't he was 
he was sold into slavery, then came over, and then he started writing all these stories that we do now, like the turtles in the hair. I didn't know that was him. Mm. And it's like it's 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 so ironic that this individual that came from a place that started using Pythagorean theorem before him, and before that, this place is cultivating all this type of culture and understanding because they understood parables and stories. Like this is the best way to um to go and like later on i'll find this other parable it is, it's really really good it basically talks about secrecy and silence and i'll post it in the group mm-hmm. and we'll go through it but it's, it was a very interesting story and that's how this book started off for my it's a kid's book i read it to my kids every night because i told them they need to learn more about like african egyptian kemet like oh they need to learn more about this so i was like hey let's just read every night and i was sitting back there blown away but hey fun time allegory man stories parables that's the best yeah, way to teach somebody symbols something. yeah symbols speak yep. to the soul like I, you know when i teach about that beautiful symbol that is your backdrop right now uh where you have the square and the compass and you have the g you know in america we have we keep the g and we, we have the g in there and we we teach that that's um geometry or god and i always teach you know the new brothers that are coming through the inner apprentice when we're talking about that i tell them i say the geometry was at the center of the operative mason's life. He could not build without geometry, the square, and the compass. Just like in this, in from a speculative perspective, the square and the compass have symbolic meaning to us speculative masons, right? The square of virtues and so on and so forth. And then you also have deity. So deity has to remain the center of the speculative mason's life and these symbols and what they inculcate, which again, we say the square, we know the square is talking about virtues, right? So at at the end of the day, you can give me a whole three or four page write up on that and I'll have to try to weave my way through it. Or you just give me a symbol or give me a story about the symbol, a parable or something, and it will stick to me um, more than if I'm reading four pages, five pages of something. That's the beauty of masonry. I, I really love um, the lessons that the symbols teach us because I can just look at the symbol and it talks to me. You know, some of the brothers we were talking about that earlier in the re- week. I asked some of the my, some of the illustrious peers, do they wear their ring every day? And they said, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, are you doing it so you can brag or show off or think you're better than someone? Absolutely not. It's simply to remind them of what their duties are. And I could just look at, you know, I have, have my ring on now. I could just look at it and it does. It's a reminder, not for the world, for me, because mm-hmm. I truly want to live up to these duties, to these lessons. And that's the hard part, man. It, it that's, it's difficult. You know, we all can, you know, like Brother Barrett, very good lecture. Uh, I think every brother on here is a very good lecture, but lecturing about something is totally different than actually going out there and taking geometry and using it to really build your character. That's tough. I don't know. I'm, I'll be 51 next month. And I can tell you, that's it's still a tough thing for me to do. Knowing all that I know, trying to apply it in my life is difficult. It's a good point. I mean, when I think of the circle, I think of um, <clears throat> center or staying centered. And usually my mind goes back to you know, like we used to say growing up, you know, staying centered in Christ, as my father would always say, stay in the middle of the road. You know, whatever you do, always weigh your options, look at the left and the right, the right and the wrong, and see where you need to be at. And like you said, knowing and is one thing, but application is another. And we're always challenged with, you know, the vicissitudes of life that come at us as we grow. Um, I'll be 42 next week. Um, and it is a, I will say it's been a journey. I'm always learning. Um, I don't know everything. And, and that's one of those things when I came into being as a past master, the first thing I told him, I said, I may say something that you may think is wise, but then you have to determine if it's wise, you know, and then if you want to apply it, because I'm still learning. I'm here to learn as well as to teach. And, and that's the thing about life, you know, and when we apply those architectural principles to it, we have foundational principles. We build off of those. We square our actions and then we angle our thoughts to that which is centered on Christ or the VSO, whoever you may call your deity, but the supreme being that is with those principles, that's that's your guiding light so that you can be a better person. And I think that's just the whole point of what we're talking about tonight. 
it's just applying those geometrical principles that can be applicable to do our thoughts and actions. So, yeah, and and Brother Williams had said something the other day in our private group we group that got me to to really thinking, and it was in reference to like what we're talking about now is when you come through masonry, masonry gives you light. Now we know light is synonymous with information, knowledge. That that's what light is. So you got the knowledge, you got the light. What do you do with it? You have to live it out. You have to walk and talk it. This is called wisdom. Wisdom is the proper application of what you know. Now, Brother William said something in our private group the other day. I think it was in our um, our, our um, Red House, Royal, Royal Art Group. Mm -hmm. And he said, who placed the capstone or the keystone to complete? Did you guys remember that? Yep. And literally, yep. you know, folks was going, hmm, hmm, hmm. <laughs> and, you know, they, you know. Stop me. Stop me at work. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but at the end of the day, who uh, who had to place that? To, in order for it to be complete, you got the wisdom. You have to be able to take what you know and live it out. And that is going to complete that temple. That's going to complete it. You know what I mean? When he said, I said, oh, man, I'm sitting back. Yes. <laughs> Fire. I, I get in these books, brother. And, you know, I. I literally, I told y'all, my wife, she's like, you know, you walk around the house and you got a book in your hand. If you're not holding a baby, you holding a book. And she says, it's a good thing, but do you do anything else? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, um, I, I sit there and um, Samuel Anvior, as many of you know him, Manly P. Hall of my favorite authors. And they always talk about you have to live, breathe, and think meditative thoughts all day long. People think meditating is just sitting down in a pose, in a posture, but meditating is actual practice that you practice 24 seven. And reading books is a meditative practice. Everything falls into some form of meditation. And that's what I do. And my thought process is a meditative process and I sit there and I take these books like the Royal Arch and that particular book in that particular degree I was reading it then I was like hold on let me go back and go back and look at the tools that were used against the Grand Master then I say hold on he got hit here and then all of a sudden we in the Royal Arch and this happens over there and it's with wisdom so you get raised with wisdom after you've been slain by ignorance. Go and ahead, then brother. wisdom completes the temple. Ooh. And do so, you see do you see wisdom at the 33rd degree too? Is it is it on that symbol? Is it, <laughs> is it you know, is it, is it there somewhere? Is, do we see wisdom all over again? <laughs> you see wisdom all over again. Everywhere. It's, it's with wisdom. God creates, mm. and God created with the point within the circle, the stism, stism, and everything went into motion. Yeah. With wisdom, everything is done. And that means you have to know everything under the sun. So God has to experience every emotion, every feeling, every sensation known to man or known to the known universe as we know it. Mm -hmm. People, we, we put our feelings and our emotions into what we think God is, but that's not really what God is. Say it again. Because in order for God to be God, God has to experience everything. Mm -hmm. God has to be everything. Mm -hmm. Just like Brother Barrett said in his lecture today, God is everything. That mm -hmm. circle is just one point within a circle in motion, and it's creating replications of itself. But in, in reality, those replications of itself are just, as Brother Watson always says, him looking at himself in the mirror mm. or looking at Michael Williams, looking back at Charles Watson, yeah. who's really here. You know, exactly. this is the same replication of a vibratory motion, sound, music, and the seven liberal arts and sciences, all of that's tied in. And, you know, somebody talked about Jacob's Ladder on uh, Facebook earlier, and this ties into Jacob's Ladder. All of this is going up and down. It's the do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. 
that's on Jacob's ladder, but it's not mentioned, but we mention it as music. It, it's a, it is a very deep subject when you talk about geometry because you have to mention music because sound vibration and all it is is motion and it's based on some type of frequency and that frequency, we don't know if it's God, something, what we call it, again, has to experience everything in existence for existence to be. Right, right. What is the first enemy of the camp in the Scottish right of the 32nd degree? Ignorance. 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 It will, it will always be. And the, beauty, the beautiful part is when you come into the lodge, who do you see? You know, that kind of confused a couple of brothers. Said, where's the knowledge at? The knowledge is the light. We already gave it to you. <laughs> so don't even worry about it. The knowledge <laughs> is the light. People confuse that. They go, hold on. They're putting, a, they're putting the wisdom before the not. No, 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 no. You got the light. That was the first thing we gave you we, when you came in. But now you're going to have to understand the wisdom to contrive, which is the plan. That's what that is. That's the wisdom to contrive. Then you find the strength to support. Contrive means to plan. You find the strength to support your plan. And then the manifestation of the word itself is the, be the beauty to adorn. You took a plan. You had the wisdom to plan it. But now you got to make that plan go. That's the strength to support. Now it's the sure. beauty to adorn all great and important undertakings. And everything we do in life follows that pattern. Creation itself is that pattern. In there, I know you guys have heard the wisdom, strength, and beauty, meaning goma, as, dubar, right? Which was uh, supposed to be uh, kind of like a, a slick way of saying God, okay? And so at the end of the day, this is the creative process. We see as we walk into a lodge, anything you want to do, if you want to start on a new lecture tomorrow, you got to have the wisdom to plan it. The second thing you have to do is you got to find the resources to support that lecture. Then you got to publish the lecture. Anything you do in life goes through those wisdom, strength, and beauty. Brother asked me, what do we got to do to fix the lodge? Wisdom, strength, and beauty, brother. That's it. It's right there. It was given to us. Any aspect of your life can be fixed through find a plan, get the wisdom to plan it, get the strength. This is project man. I'm a certified project manager. So this is what you do in project management as well. You know what I mean? You get, you get the project plan, you get your work breakdown structure, you allocate your resources, you track your milestones, so on and so forth. It's right here in Mason. Beautiful. There you go. It's the, it's the. Yes, sir. Well, uh, we're going to go ahead and conclude the, um, the live broadcasting of Esoteric Lighthouse this month. Uh, stay tuned next month. We got a special treat uh, coming your way in regards to Hebrew and uh, the, the meaning and the need of the understanding of Hebrew and masonry given by our illustrious brother, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Pike Robert House Mackey, <laughs> uh, the illustrious <laughs> man, the myth, the legend who, who knows right. he, he's the greatest linguistic individual on the planet in my opinion. So uh, he's gonna show us some linguistic uh, connotations and why it's important for us to understand this in masonry. So tune in next, uh, next month for this episode. All right, good night.